A warm welcome to today's talk, Saturday the 22nd of January. Now, given that I'm going to be exposed to Omicron, I guess I need to decide when am I going to be exposed to Omicron. And that's an interesting calculation, really, because it's inevitable that I am going to be exposed to Omicron. So we'll be talking a bit more about me later. But before we do, I want to look at where Omicron has gone. Now, I want to start off with the United States. Now, this is the latest data from the United States here. And as we see, um, amazing to think that as of the 27th of November, there was no Omicron in the United States. It was nearly all Delta and now it's completely taken over. And we anticipated this on this channel way back in the beginning of December, as soon as we learnt about the characteristic transmission, the transmission characteristics of Omicron. And we actually did predict that it would displace Delta as well, which it has done. Now, we can't tell that absolutely from this uh, shot here because this is percentages, but we know it has taken over. And here we have it, Omicron in the United States, 99.5% uh, now of prevalence. And the range of estimates there is 993 to 99.7%. So we see it has taken over very little delta. And this is a, uh, this is a, remarkab this is a remarkably good thing that this has happened. And uh, looking at the, uh, again, the percentages in different parts of the state, so a little bit hanging on here in the middle, but, but basically this is all purple, which means it's all uh, Omicron. And of course, the position would be the same for the UK. Now, the United Kingdom's due to update this data soon, but this is UK data as of the uh, 12th of January. So even on the 12th of January, good couple of, get on, well, a couple of weeks ago now, growth advantage, we knew, we knew there was a high confidence level on that. Transmissibility, I'm sure that will now turn red with a high level of transmissibility as well, with high levels of confidence. We now know these to be true. Immune evasion, including vaccines and naturally derived immunity, red with high levels of confidence as of the 20th of January. But the data has maintained that it is still protecting to high levels. The natural immunity and the vaccine is protecting to high levels against severe disease, which re really is, is quite remarkably good that this, is, this has been maintained. Uh, infection severity in adults, green. That means not as bad with a high level of confidence. Children, well... It's got amber here. I think that may well turn green with a higher level of confidence soon. I'm sure it's not going to go red. So when this is updated in a few days time next week, that's going to be amber or green. I'm sure it won't be red. Um, so more, more, more data to come on that. Child, children are being, um, being affected more, but there again, they have lower levels of uh, vaccination as well. So that's just a sort of... Um, orientation graphics now um omicron in the united states um the, the ch check all that out that was those references there amazing 29th of november was the first case of omicron in the united states the index case what we might call patient zero <coughs> patient zero a 48 year old uh, unvaccinated man who had been to a conference in nigeria so he'd recently flown home from nigeria it was an international conference in nigeria so there was people from different parts of Africa there who we'd interacted with face to face, then decided to get on an aeroplane and fly back to the United States, where he promptly infected all members of his own household. Uh, so in Nebraska, six people diagnosed by PCR and genomic sequencing. And the onset, the incubation period, we found out from looking at when this chap came back to when the six people were infected was 73 hours. And the range was 33 to 75 hours. So three, it's, a, it's a pretty short period of time, isn't it? Three days, two to three days. So incubation period for Omicron is different. The original version, the B11, uh, basically the B11 variant from the original Wuhan strain, the incubation period there from when someone was first exposed to when they developed symptoms was five days. Uh, Delta variant, it went down to four days. And with the Omicron, it's gone down to two to three days, typically more nearer the two day mark. So interesting. Now, viral load's interesting. Now, the Alpha and Delta variant, peak viral load was three days after infection, meaning that typically people would be infectious for a day or two before they became symptomatic and a few days afterwards. Uh, clear, people would clear the virus about six days after that. So in other words, that would be uh, that. That would be a uh, day day one there. 
uh, peak viral load about three days after infection. So they would, they would have peak um, after infection. So if the infection was, say, four days, so go back. So, so they say got infected. So that's one, two, three, four days before. So they'd be infected then. And then about three days after that, they would become infectious. So they would be infectious then from day one. And then they would have the they would probably clear the virus by about day six after infection. One, two, three, four, five, six. So they would be infectious. They would be infectious from uh, one or two days before to about six days after the onset of symptoms at that point there. With the alpha and the delta really quite similar. Uh, clear the virus after about six days. Omicron, we don't actually have this data on Omicron. But it looks like it's probably very much the same or, or the time is a bit shorter. So people are going to, well, we know people are infectious pre-symptomatically. People are infectious asymptomatically, but people are probably clearing the virus a bit quicker. On average, this is just average figures. The whole thing with Omicron is that it's all compressed. It happens in a shorter period of time. Um, but we, we await firm data on that because that is not, that's not yet definitive. So th this paper here, infectious viral load in unvaccinated and vaccinated uh, patients infected with sars coronavirus 2 Delta and Omicron. That was the paper. Do check out the reference yourself. Omicron and Delta produce similar levels of infectious virus. So similar levels of virus being produced, according to this paper here. Interesting. So why is the Omicron so much more transmissible if several similar levels of virus are being produced to give similar viral loads in the body. Uh, two reasons. One is that the Omicron affects the upper airways, so it's easier for the virus to come out during normal speaking, coughing, things like that. And as well as that, I think we have to assume that the virus is, uh, is much better at latching onto the ACE2 receptor sites. It's better at infecting our cells, but it does so more in the upper airways than in the lower airways, which is why this is nothing like as bad as it sounds in fact it's positively it's positively positively good news uh, infection for a, a day shorter with omicron compared to delta as we said everything's a bit shorter with omicron omicron infects upper airways as opposed to the lungs and this is probably the main reason why it's causing less severe disease it's not getting into the lungs therefore it's not causing the inflammatory reactions in the lungs and of course when things are in the lungs it's a very short microscopic membrane away through the alveoli into the capillaries into the blood and then you can go around all the systems of the body with the virus and the toxins so when things get into the lungs they're much more likely to cause a systemic sort of septic viremia as, as it goes everywhere whereas in the upper airways you've got really big thick cartilage lined uh, airways that are going to keep the virus uh, out of a lot of the blood and nice thick mucous membranes and all the cilia and all, all that all that sort of thing and not so much thick mucous membranes it's a thin it's a thin mucous membrane but you've got quite a lot of uh, sub uh, uh, quite a lot of what's called areola tissue beneath the initial membrane that makes it quite thick and harder for the infection to get across so upper airway infections are not associated with systemic sepsis in the same way that lower airway infections are uh, omicron antibodies neutralize delta virus so delta antibodies do not neutralize Omicron virus. So people that have had Delta still get symptomatic Omicron, but people that have had Omicron do make antibodies which work against Delta. So the people who've had Omicron are going to be immune to Delta, therefore the Delta's run out of people to infect, and that's one of the reasons why it's simply taken over. It really couldn't be uh, much better than it's been. Now, um, Offshoot of the, the a new offshoot of the um, of the Omicron variant. Now I'm just going to show you this diagram that looked at a few days ago. So this is the original virus here, and uh, gamma evolved up this way, and beta evolved up that way, and alpha evolved out this way, and delta evolved down this way. And these are the different delta forms. So this is all the delta. And this area here, we would call this area here the delta clade. The, uh, the genetic, like, like you are part of your grandfather's clade and part of your great-grandfather's clade, this cladal analysis. Now what's happened now is Omicron is divided into two. So there is now an extra clade with uh, Omicron. 
Um, but it's still very much related to the Omicron and in the Omicron clade. So we're, just as the Delta var viruses, the, the various slight genetic variations in the Delta had similar characteristics, we would expect those genetic characteristics to be the same with the uh, Omicron variants. Now, it was completely 100%. In fact, we did predict that Omicron will mutate. Of course, it will mutate. Viruses mutate all the time. It's a question of whether, whether the selection pressure leads to that particular variant or that particular mutant becoming widespread. But the point is another one has been identified. So there's now an offshoot of the Omicron variant identified in England and in other places. So the Omicron is now no longer this simple line. It has split into two in the same way that the Delta split into several. It's split into two. So am I worried about this? The answer is no. And uh, let's look at why not. So this is called BA.2. Uh, it may be even more contagious than the initial Omicron. Now, if it is, we would expect that to become the most prevalent variant as it outcompetes the, the older Omicron. UK Health Security Agency has designated this BA to a variant under investigation. So it's a V... What is it? A variant under investigation. It's, 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 not a, it's not a VOC yet. It's not a variant of concern. So what I would expect, I would expect this to become more prevalent if indeed it turns out to be more infectious. And it may be that because it's more infectious, it will outcompete the original Omicron. But because it's in the Omicron clade with similar characteristics, I'm not expecting it to be more pathogenic. In fact, it could turn out to be a good thing because it could spread a less pathogenic form of Omicron around really more quickly, generating more herd immunity, possibly generating less severe disease. We don't know that yet, but we've certainly no reason to assume it will be generating more severe disease. Uh, it may have an increased growth rate over the BA1, so the virus might replicate quicker inside people. So the original Omicron is now BA1, so that's the way it's now being described. So this would be BA1. We now have another offshoot, which is BA2, but it, it is in the same clade. As far as I know, there's just two mutations different from the original Omicron. So inevitable and may turn out actually to be a, to be a good thing. We don't know that yet. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today is the vaccine, uh, the vaccine effectiveness with Omicron. We've got a special report in a minute, but um, vaccine effectiveness with Omicron. So this is from the, uh, this is from the UK government site here. Uh, after two doses, the primary course of vaccination, vaccine protection against mild disease has largely disappeared by 20 weeks after vaccination. So there you go. After your two vaccines, 20 weeks later, your protection against symptomatic disease has largely disappeared, which is why millions of us in the UK have recently had symptomatic Omicron. And you, you, you've either had it yourself or you'll know, know someone who has, and many of you have told me this, of course. So after 20 weeks, it's largely disappeared. The protection against severe disease is still there to a good extent. So people that have had two doses of vaccine still enjoy reasonable, reasonable levels of protection, not as good as three doses, but reasonable levels of protection against severe disease. But their protection against symptomatic disease is virtually gone. After a booster dose, <coughs> protection initially uh, increased to around 65 to 70 percent against symptomatic disease. But drops to 45 to 50 percent from 10 weeks after that. So mine, mine, mine will be in the process of dropping down. So um, 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 mine was about 10 weeks ago now. So I would have been 65 to 70 percent protected against symptomatic disease. I probably was exposed to it during that 10 weeks. Probably. I don't know. I've, I never tested positive, uh, but drops down to 45 to 50 percent from 10 weeks. There, therefore, uh, and this is direct quote, it is therefore likely that current vaccines offer limited long term protection against infection or transmission. So this idea that we should get vaccinated to protect those around us yeah that's true for 10 weeks but after that it isn't really it isn't really true after that and after two doses uh after tw 20 weeks after the two dose but dropping quite a bit after uh 10 weeks after the second dose so it's very much a law of diminishing returns so we get 20 weeks protection from two doses but then the booster dose against symptomatic disease and spreading the disease to others only 10 week protection 
And I think, and I'm going to clar- hoping to clarify the science on this pretty soon, uh, that if you have a fourth dose, you'll get even greater diminishing returns and maybe only five weeks protection or something. But the protection against severe disease is maintained. And, and isn't, it, isn't it fortunate that it's this way around? Dear me. Protection against severe disease. Vaccine effectiveness at hospitali- against hospitalisation estimated at 92%. Uh, that's after a booster dose. That's after a booster. And remains high at 83% for 10 or more weeks after the booster dose. So presumably three months, four months, five months after the booster dose, we still have 83% prote- protection against hospitalisation. Um, what about uh, six months after? Probably what about a year after probably still not 83 but probably quite reasonable because of the memory t cells the way this works so i've just been thinking about me i don't normally do this but thinking about me so my booster my third dose so i i had i had a pfizer then i had a pfizer and then i had a moderna Uh, now i didn't ask for either of these at the time i got the pfizers it was uh more much more likely that i would have got the oxford astrazeneca which would have been fine but um, it's just what they had left in the surgery and they said come around. So I went and I had a Moderna booster, which is OK. Um, well, they didn't aspirate, but apart from that, it was all right. So 20th of November. So my protection against hospitalisation is going to go down from 92% to 83% uh, soon by soon. Soon. OK, uh, unless, of course, I become exposed and uh, my immune system recognises the natural Omicron variant and gives me a big immune boost. So what we can say is for the first 10 weeks I've got after my booster, which I've had, 20th of November, 92% protection. It's going to go down to 83% protection against hospitalisation soon for me personally. So which would I rather have 92% protection against hospitalisation or 83% protection against hospitalisation? Well, obviously, the 93%, the 92% is better than the 83%. But but my protection is going to go down to 83% soon, unless I'm exposed. So, um, could it be that it's better for me to be exposed nowish, given that I'm going to be exposed? Because if I'm exposed to the natural virus, when I've still got these nice high levels of protection against my from my booster dose... Then I'm going to get another massive immune boost after that and hopefully be immune for years after that. Whereas if I carry on protecting myself, my protection against hospitalisation is going to go down to 83%. Now, this is just me musing about myself. I don't know your circumstances. I know mine, but that is my musing about me. Now, um, that's not giving you any advice because I don't know you, but that's my thinking about me personally. Now, we're going to go on to John Meredith now, who's going to give us a report from Panama. He has reported before. So, uh, John, thank you very much, and uh, and o- over to you. Hi, John. This is John from Panama, Central America. Panama, of course, famous for its um, canal and fine weather. Uh, we don't have any winter here. Um, any seasons we have... Uh, it's either raining season, which is tropical rainstorms, or it's fine and sunny. And we're in the fine and sunny summertime now months. So we get about six months of each. It's either pouring of tropical rain or it's a uh, nice sunshine. But the temperatures are the same in the 30s odd uh, pretty much throughout the year. Uh, as to COVID, in 2000 and uh, 2021, uh, we had quite a tough time of it. And we had a lot of lockdowns. Uh, we had a situation where men and women could only go out on alternate days and then only for a couple of hours. And, um, and uh, those two hours, you could either do exercise or you could go shopping. Um, but uh, you couldn't go out with your wife. You had to go on your own. Men one day, women another. No one ever really worked out the reason behind that. but. There were very severe restrictions. The only thing that remains now is the mask wearing, which people accept here pretty well. You wear a mask as soon as you step outside the house, and you wear it all the time, including in your car. So people immediately say, well, why are you wearing a mask in your car? 
The reason being that at police checkpoints or if you're stopped by the police, um, you have to wind the window down and then of course you have to interact with the police and you have to scramble around looking for a mask, etc., etc. And they found there were so many COVID cases amongst the, um, uh, the uh, police that they insisted that you wore a mask all the time in the car in case you got stopped. And it's not, inf not infrequently that you did get stopped in the previously with the various roadblocks and areas you couldn't enter because there was um, COVID restrictions. People accept mask wearing here pretty well, um, except for the bane of my life, and that is joggers. Joggers seem to think they're exempt and they'll happily jog past you whilst you're taking your evening stroll. Um, spewing out potential virus in all directions. Uh, we had a fairly good start in, uh, good, good performance in December. We got the um, positivity rate down below 5% and um, most of the restrictions were lifted, apart from mask wearing. And things were going along nicely until, of course, the famous Omicron hit Panama. Uh, we're bordered on one side by Costa Rica and the other by Colombia, so it was, it was inevitable. Plus, of course, we're a major gateway by air and by sea, being our geographical location. So starting January, Omicron hit. Um, things remained open as far as the uh, regulations were concerned. And, of course, Omicron has just spiralled straight up the chart. Um, I, I don't have... John's uh, ability to do technical stuff here, but this is the chart. You can see it's just gone straight up the top and it carries on going up, but we're now getting about 12,000 cases a day. We started off the beginning of the month um, with a positivity rate still down below three, four, somewhere around there. Uh, and it's now currently 35%. And I think, uh, John would probably fall over in a fit if he saw that figure in the UK or anywhere else. There's massive um, COVID transmission around at 35%, as you can well, well see. Um, hospitalizations, which were fairly low at the beginning of the year, have now gone from about uh, 200 to we're now up to um, 600, 700. In fact, the last figure yesterday was 700 cases of, of uh, hospitalizations. And, and, and what's more worrying, I think, is that the number of deaths have um, gone from about two a day to 11 a day. So the story about it being a milder disease, I think, needs to be taken a little bit with a pinch of salt. Because our experience here is, certainly in Latin America, Central America, is that Omicron is actually quite a dangerous uh, disease. The um, ICUs have uh, doubled in number of people in there since the beginning of the month. Um, and we're only up to the 20th. So we're nowhere near peaking. And um, it's a massive amount of community spread out here in uh, in Panama. It's um, worth noting, of course, that uh, along with the controls and the frustrations that people have had, that there still uh, tends to be a lackadaisical issue as to when you get positive. There's no home test. This is the unfortunate thing. The only way you can go testing is go to a central testing station, of which they do do about... Uh, 35,000 um, a day, actually, for a community of 4 million is reasonably good. Um, as I say, positivity over 35% as well now. And um, people are frustrated, of course, like everywhere else. And there's a tendency now, if you are positive, uh, then people t still tend to t go to work, unfortunately, and circulate, although they're not supposed to. Theoretically, you're supposed to have your vaccination card certificate shown when you go into a restaurant, but that's not enforced. Um, nothing like that is enforced, unfortunately. The police can stop you and check you on a central register, which they have on a radio system. And if you're shown 
to be um, registered as a positive case because you're, you're supposed to register when you're positive, then um, uh, they come down on you like a ton of bricks, quite rightly so. A very heavy fines so they catch you on the street or in the um, mass transit system and you're actually registered as a positive case. The general approach to it is, as I say, like everywhere else, frustration, um, waiting for that graph to s turn over the top. Um, I know this uh, happened in, um, it's starting to happen in the US, so we're hoping that we will follow shortly the US and start to see a dip in that very large spike that we're getting. In terms of vaccination, it's not a bad take up, I think. We got 57% of the population are now fully vaccinated, which is not as good, of course, as the UK and elsewhere, but for Latin America, that's pretty good. There's not a large section of anti-vaxxers. Uh, people are happy to get the vaccine when they can. Um, and of course, we can only vaccinate people who, um, when we get the vaccines coming in to, uh, to service the community. One good thing about Panama is that it, as a big uh, maritime uh, flag state, it is actually vaccinating seafarers. And I know, John, you've mentioned before the value that um, the people who are working in and keeping us uh, stocked with food and the shelves filled and whatever. We shouldn't forget the seafarers who are uh, going um, about their duties and have had a very, very tough time of it. They've, we know here in Panama that sometimes that they can't even get off the ship and fly home when their leave is uh, due because they, um, they're not allowed to leave, to leave the vessel. But the government now are vaccinating seafarers and that's good news. Um, they get the first dose here, maybe they get the second dose in London. And a shout out here for the mission to seafarers based in England who have been supporting and um, lobbying, if you like, the governments of the world to help seafarers get vaccines. So thank you, missions to seafarers. So that's about it, John. Um, I hope that gives you some feel for what's happening here and um, look forward to following you as always. John, excellent report. Thank you very much for that. 35% positivity. Wow, that means there is massive community spread. That means basically everyone's going to be exposed to it pretty soon. 57% fully vaccinated, so there's quite a few people that haven't. That could well be what is accounting for the disproportionately increased hospitalizations and deaths in Panama compared to the UK, for example. And in the UK, for uh, in the UK, the, the, the intensive care unit capacity didn't go up at all during the Omicron wave. So we can only assume that because there's, what, 43% there not vaccinated, that's what's made that big difference. Excellent point there about seamen and the supplies and the mission to seafarers who've been advocating for this, uh, for this grouping, which is... Uh, it's good, and of course, in Panama, the canal's only only a few feet away, so you can you're certainly going to be very aware of that. I'd love to go and visit the Panama Canal; it looks fantastic, amazing. I've seen it on pictures. Okay, so um, it's going to it's going to romp through Panama really quickly with 35% positivity, but hospitalizations, deaths, and intensive care unit admissions are going to stay up well into February. In fact, for most of February, from what information you've given me there John so a difficult time ahead but excellent report and certainly fascinating to learn what's going on round about the world and no substitute for getting the report from someone who actually lives there which is brilliant so thank you very much that uh, for that report John excellent and thank you for watching